Some flashlights are durable tools intended for hard use. Some are designed for maximum performance or the best value per dollar. And some lights are simply designed by madmen. Based on the D4V2, the DT8 is a dual quad light with twice as many emitters, providing double the power and triple the fun. This pure hot rod of a flashlight remains shockingly compact, while offering a unique design with customizable auxiliary LEDs and running on the Andoral 2 firmware. The DT8 is a weird looking light, being small and compact, with a rectangular head housing eight main emitters. The build is excellent, with precise machining and thick even anodizing on the aluminum body. The main tube is identical to the D4V2, and features the same fantastic knurling and thick, smooth threads. The interior of the light features the highest quality hardware, with gold-plated beryllium copper springs in both ends, and a solid copper MC PCB for the main emitters. The head of the light is the biggest and most dramatic difference from the D4, featuring a dual quad design that sports eight primary LEDs and eight RGB auxiliaries, both mounted on rectangular PCBs with a cutout sandwich design. The main emitters sit below two square Carco optics that provide a floody beam pattern. Above is a large piece of mineral crystal glass with great anti-reflective coating, and the whole thing is secured by a super cool rectangular stainless steel bezel with 12 mounting screws. This design is quite unconventional, and the head can be tricky to disassemble. Most of the components used are highly unique and would be difficult to replace. The light uses a pair of either clear or frosted square-shaped polycarbonate optics, which are very similar to those used in Hank's other small quads. The pill features large cooling fins and a beautiful lighted button with customizable LED colors. There is a stainless steel retaining ring surrounding the switch, available in raised or flat varieties. The raised version helps prevent accidental button presses, which is pretty valuable in such a powerful light. The head definitely sports a strange design with its flattened shape. While it looks bulky in pictures, it's actually very small and compact in person, being barely larger than the D4V2 in practice. The head is heavy and feels great to hold, giving the light a nice balance in the hand. This is still not something that I would regularly carry in a pocket, as the head is just too wide, but it's much more portable than I expected it to be. The creator of this light, Hank, gives this light an IP67 waterproof rating, and no drop rating. While it's fine for normal usage, I would not expect this light to be especially durable. To be honest with you guys, when I first saw the announcement of this light, I thought it was kind of stupid. Why use such a bulky, impractical head and still rely on an 18650 cell? Especially when it seemed like a 21700 would be far better balanced with a large head, and would provide greater output and runtime. Now that I've held the light and spent quite a bit of time with it, I now understand what Hank was thinking when he designed the DT8. This is not supposed to compete with larger 21700 lights, the K9.3 fits into that space instead. This is actually meant to be a very compact light, which serves as basically a D4V2 Extreme Edition. And indeed, this little flashlight is by far one of the most powerful single 18650 lights on the market. In my time with it, I have very much come to appreciate this design, and while weird, I love its eccentric style, and most importantly, the incredible amount of light this thing can produce. The DT8 is all about extreme output, and rocks a 9 amp linear driver equipped with the FET for direct drive on turbo. The brightness will be dependent on both the battery used and the LEDs chosen. I am running both of my lights on the very powerful Molasel P26A, and have one light equipped with Osram W2 emitters for maximum performance. The other sports Nishia 219Bs, which provide a beautiful high CRI beam with fantastic tint and color rendering. The Nishias are not as bright, and the firmware is also limiting the FET to reduce maximum output, as these LEDs cannot be pushed as hard as the Osrams before burning out. I tested these lights with the Mollus LP26A and the Samsung 30Q, which respectively provide 25 amps and 15 amps of constant current. For 18350 mode, I used a key power 10 amp cell. The higher the cell's constant current, the greater the output. Running on the P26A, the W2 model produces an absolutely incredible output of 8,600 lumens at startup, which is genuinely amazing given its small size. This just blasts darkness away out of any area and is completely blinding when used indoors. The Samsung 30Q provides reduced output, but is still tremendously impressive with 7,800 lumens at startup. The key power cell comes in at 5,700 lumens, which is a huge decrease but is still pretty insane. Even with its dimmer LEDs, the Nishia 219B equipped model still provides a huge amount of light. The P26A pushes 3,300 lumens, while the 30Q actually draws even here, with 3,300 as well, so it's probably the better match for this light with its higher capacity. The key power provides 1,000 lumens less at startup. 
While it's true that the W2 is significantly more powerful than the 219B model, both are extremely impressive and very satisfying to use at night, as they brightly illuminate a large area. Both are simply way too bright to be used regularly indoors in turbo mode. However, as expected, this output is very short-lived, and runtimes overall are rather short. Turbo holds for a mere 10 seconds before dropping like a rock, and the output will fall and then rise before stabilizing after only 90 seconds or so. As the light adjusts for temperature over time, the output will continue to gradually rise and fall. While it looks bad on the graph, the stable level is actually still very high. While nowhere close to the immediate turbo level, the W2 provided a consistent and well-regulated output of over 700 lumens. 700 lumens is far from mind-blowing, but it's still too bright to be useful most of the time. Remember that this sustained output is coming from a single 18650, which is actually quite impressive. It is also worth noting that the stable level will actually rise over time before the cell dies. Importantly, if kept cool, this light can produce a much higher stable output, as it is entirely dependent on temperature. The 219B light shows exactly the same characteristics, but with reduced output. After 30 seconds, the light stabilizes at a mere 275 lumens, which is just okay, bearing in mind the dimmer LEDs. This is still a bright level, which more than covers most uses, but is far from a sustained level achievable with the Osrams. With repeated turbo activations, these lights will devour batteries at an alarming rate, and even with just a single activation and run, the little key power 18350 only manages about 50 minutes of runtime on the W2. These are definitely not lights to use if battery life is a concern, with the driver pulling up to a solid 9 amps of drain on its highest regulated level, and far more on turbo. Beware that if you're sticking to higher outputs and are running super high drain cells, you will potentially need several batteries to make it through a night of use. These lights are extremely bright, and to nobody's surprise, they rapidly get very hot. There will be an immediate step down from the turbo level, and the DT8 will become painful to hold as the heat builds up throughout the entire body. Unfortunately, while the light is very comfortable to hold in general, the heat builds up most around the button and directly where I rest my fingers on the opposite side, making it difficult to work with when hot. There is of course intelligent temperature control, which is configurable in the UI. Normally, I don't try to push my lights too much, but in the case of the W2 model, I made an exception to get more performance, as it seemed appropriate. The factory default target temperature is 45 degrees Celsius, and I bumped mine to a relatively modest 55 degrees Celsius. In my testing, this provided a minimal increase in output and runtime on turbo, and got much hotter. 70 degrees Celsius is the maximum temperature allowed, which I definitely do not recommend trying, but I mean, it's doable if you want to go there. Either way, you might want to wear gloves while using this light on turbo. The electronics inside are pretty tough, and the maximum temperature is more to protect the user than the light. While the light possesses intelligent temperature control, Andural merely provides a reactive system, with the turbo activation always jumping to the maximum available output. If the light is already warm, the heat will simply build, and the whole body can get extremely hot, far exceeding the target temperature, so be very careful when repeatedly forcing this light to turbo. Being aluminum, the body of the light itself will heat up faster than the onboard sensor, but the large cooling fins help it to stabilize pretty quickly. The step down and heat buildup depend on the ramp level, as the temperature sensor is found within the ATtiny controller on board the driver. On the highest levels, the heat is primarily generated by the driver components, and step down will happen faster relative to the amount of heat generated. On turbo, the LEDs are taking almost all of the current, becoming the main source of the heat. As the emitters are physically further from the sensor, the temperatures will get higher and the light won't sense the buildup as quickly. Finally, Andorl 2 allows for momentary turbo activation with a quick double press and hold from off. This actually operates turbo without temperature regulation, so if you're a maniac who wants a literal torch, you'll appreciate this feature. It goes without saying that the maximum output on this light will quickly burn anything that gets in the way. If you decide to cram this thing into your pocket and it manages to then accidentally turn itself on, you're in for a nasty surprise. There are many safety features in the UI to prevent this, so it should be very unlikely, but nonetheless, the DT8 is potentially very dangerous. And hopefully this is obvious, but this thing is bright enough that it should never be pointed into another person's eyes. The battery tube is very tight and compact, allowing only unprotected cells, which are required for this level of performance anyways. Please practice proper battery safety, as these cells are even more dangerous than the light itself if mishandled. Beyond the LEDs, this performance comes virtue of the linear driver, which provides 9 amps of regulated current, and has a FET for Turbo's direct drive. This is the same driver provided with the linear D4V2 and the KR4, but it's quite a bit stronger. If the light is equipped with Nietzsche E21As, the FET will be disabled via firmware, 
preventing these sensitive emitters from burning out. In this case, it will still provide a maximum of 9 amps, which is plenty for very high outputs. The Nichia 219B LEDs will ship with a firmware version that limits the FET to 60% at turbo using PWM, but I'm actually using a firmware version which provides slightly less power, just to be on the safe side. This results in only about an 11% output drop on turbo, but a fair bit less heat is produced, which is a worthwhile trade-off for me. The FET will provide pure direct drive to the LEDs from the battery, so the choice of battery will affect the maximum output. In keeping with the hot rod philosophy here, I recommend and prefer to use the Mollus LP26A, which provides 25 amps of constant current. The capacity suffers a bit at 2600 milliamp hours, but in this case, it's a reasonable trade-off for the sheer power it can provide. Because this driver is using the same linear regulator we've seen before, it will have the same struggles on the lowest ramp levels. However, Toykeeper has very recently provided a cool new firmware update that largely fixes the issue with slow starts and flickering, and provides much more granular control at these lowest levels. There are now 10 distinct brightness levels before the driver runs stably and produces an output of 1.5 lumens, which is really nice. The lowest few levels will still struggle to activate after being used on turbo, but I don't consider this to be a practical issue, since there's no real reason to use Moonlight immediately after turbo anyways. Overall, this is a huge improvement and makes Moonlight far more usable. This update is not exclusive to the DT8, of course, coming to the other lights equipped with this linear driver. The DT8 naturally uses the same flashing pins seen on other Hank lights, allowing for firmware updates with a separately purchased flashing kit. One more interesting note on the driver, when PWM is working to control brightness at the higher levels, a high-pitched whine is noticeable, especially in the 219 version. Rather amusingly, various noise patterns can be generated with the different strobe modes. With some creativity, somebody could probably use these to make music of some sort. The DT8 is equipped with 8 RGB auxiliary LEDs below the optics, and 4 colored LEDs beneath the white switch cover. This system is exactly the same as the D4V2, the only difference being the placement of the LEDs, with both sections of the head having four each. Brightness levels are the same, with high being very high and low being very low, and the respective current draw is the same as the D4V2 as well, which is dependent on the battery voltage. Because high is so bright, it will quickly drain cells like the P26A. There's not much to say here that I haven't already addressed, but I still love these auxiliaries and find they really elevate the cool factor and the usefulness of the light. I actually think they look a bit better on this one, with the dual plus pattern underneath the optics. A neat feature is the new disco mode that comes with the new firmware. I find this mode obnoxious, but it's kind of fun and seems like an appropriate match for this light. Speaking of firmware, this light comes loaded with the new and improved Anduril 2, the update to Toykeeper's ever popular open source flashlight UI. This is a super advanced and complicated interface, and we'll get a separate video, so I'll just cover a few things. I love Andril, and I think it's perfect for enthusiasts, but it's probably too much for the average user. This UI is very complex and feature-rich, and makes perfect sense in a light like this. The basic operation will be very familiar to most flashlight users. Pressing the button turns the light on, while pressing and holding ramps up or down. A press turns the light off, while pressing and holding from off turns the light on to the lowest level. Double pressing while off turns the light on to high, and double pressing while on activates turbo, though this can be configured as desired. The light can operate as stepped or ramped, with three presses while on switching between the two modes. The maximum and minimum levels can be configured, as can the number of discrete levels in stepped mode. A neat addition is the ability to set only a single stepped level, providing basic on-off functionality for those who want it. There are some other cool new features here, one of my favorites being the new sunset timer. Instead of relying on a totally separate mode, you are now able to set any desired brightness level in the main ramp to a configurable timer. Another important change is the new Simple UI, which replaced the older Muggle mode. This is a more complete implementation of a secondary UI, which greatly simplifies operation and limits performance for safety, with the goal of providing something easier for the unenlightened to use. Android 2 is designed to default to Simple UI, so be aware of this when receiving a light for the first time. Importantly, Android does offer some valuable safety features, such as lockout mode, which still provides usable light, with access to both the minimum and memorized ramp levels. The light can also be set to lockout automatically after a set amount of time. Simple UI disables turbo completely, and the maximum available output can be reduced to any level desired. The light can be physically locked out at the tail as well. There are, however, a couple issues I still have with this UI. The first is the momentary access to turbo from off, accomplished with the quick double press and hold. It's a neat feature, but sometimes I simply want to turn the light on and immediately start ramping, 
and instead I activate turbo and completely blind myself. Another important safety feature is the turbo reactivation, which is done by another quick double press after the light steps down. Normally I will use turbo for several seconds and then double press to drop back down into the previous level without turning the light off. However, because the DT8 starts dropping so quickly, it will sometimes instead jump back up to turbo, which will almost burn my hand with the immediate heat that results. So yeah, Anderhal's complex and this light is super powerful. Please be careful while using it. The head's shape may suggest an irregular beam pattern, but because of convergence, the DT8 will produce exactly the same beam as the D4V2 and KR4. This is a wide and floody profile with a great even hotspot and faint gradual spill. In general, this is not a throwy light and is much better suited for area lighting tasks, but it's pretty capable of general usage indoors and out. The Nishia 219B LEDs are revered for their excellent color rendering, and these here are the SW35 bin, which provide a CRI of 92, excellent color rendering, and a warm rosy beam that just looks fantastic. There's no real tint shift here, with the Carclo optics providing a very clean and pleasant beam that complements the emitters very nicely. It just looks amazing at night, and the tremendous output is extremely satisfying as it washes everything in this beautiful warm light. The Osram W2s are much more intense emitters and don't provide the nicest beam. The hotspot is still clean and is much tighter with greater intensity. However, there is little spill here, and the beam has a rather ugly periphery, with visible cartwheeling, rings, and other artifacts. In usage, however, the lack of spill is mostly negated by the sheer volume of light being produced, and this thing just illuminates everything like crazy. Its intense hotspot is decently throwy, and will punch a massive wall of light impressively far. It really is a sight to behold, and I just love using this thing at night. The W2 are only available in a low CRI, cool white color of about 6000K. The tint is okay, with a bit of green visible in the edges of the hotspot. While it compares very poorly to the Nishias, it's really not bad on its own, and the color is overall decent, which is perfectly acceptable for the benefit of 8000 lumens. The optics here are different from the 10620 series used in the D4V2, but are still standard optics which can be swapped out fairly easily, and there are other versions which provide different beam patterns. I think it would be a lot of fun to experiment with two different optics to produce a better combination of throw and spill. As with all Hank lights, there are many different emitter options to choose from, which will affect the final price of the light. The emitters themselves will have a bigger impact on beam quality and performance than any other factor. I've only tried these two, but I do have some thoughts. For one, the E21A option doesn't seem super appealing to me. Although they do have the best color rendering of any of the options, the performance is just kind of underwhelming in my opinion, and doesn't seem like the best match for this light. The light is also available with the SST20s in either a high or low CRI version, which provide decent output, but again, if you're spending this much money, I'd opt for something better. In particular, the Cree XBL High offers better tint and a significant boost in performance and efficiency, offering almost 7,000 lumens of maximum output with a more intense beam and less heat. Overall, I think these may be the best and most practical option. It might be my top recommendation. One option that I have seen online and which may become regularly available is the Samsung LH351D. This emitter provides a great high CRI beam and still gets very bright, and seems to be a fantastic match for the DT8. Should it become regularly available, it's definitely a great option to consider. Ultimately, these two variations here are my favorite overall. The Nietzsche 219B because it provides such a nice beam, and still is incredibly bright. Many enthusiasts are in love with this LED, and it's easy to see why, with its beautiful rosy tint. This is perfect if you're a tint snob and CRI lover, and still want lots of light. On the other hand, the Osram W2 really takes the hot rod concept to the max. Though cool in color and low CRI, the output is genuinely awe-inspiring. This setup lights up an area even more dramatically than the resulting smile lights up my face. However, both of these emitters have lower availability than the more standard options. The 219B is no longer in production, and while Hank seems to have a large quantity on hand, long-term availability is not guaranteed. The Osram W2 is an emitter that Hank did not really want to put in the DT8 due to thermal issues, but did so anyway at Jackson Lee's request. If you want the W2s, they're only carried at Jackson's store where they are a bit pricier than the other options. I definitely recommend giving the W2 a try. You will not be disappointed. Okay, so more than once already, I've claimed that this is an impractical flashlight, but I'd like to revisit that statement. Is the DT8 a practical option compared to other high-end lights in general? No, absolutely not. It's weirdly shaped, offers poor run times and thermals, cannot sustain its high output, is rather delicate, and doesn't provide literally any functional advantage over the D4V2, 
which is already not the most practical light ever. However, at the end of the day, a flashlight has one primary goal, to produce light. The DT8 most certainly does just that, and many other things as well. Just because there are more reasonable options does not mean this light won't function, but rather that it isn't an easy recommendation to give for someone who simply needs a tool. It is, however, plenty valuable in the dark, and let's be real here, light is light. I'd be perfectly happy using the DT8 when I need to see things in the dark. All of this comes in a package that is actually very small. The DT8 is not a big beast of a flashlight, but rather a little flashlight with crazy capabilities and a very fun design. So can I recommend the MSR DT8? Absolutely, yes. This is one of the funnest lights I've used, and I like it even more than the D4V2. It provides literally everything that would make a hardcore nerdy enthusiast happy, and provides plenty of bragging rights to go with it. With loads of power and tons of customization, there's so much to love here. As long as you understand what you're getting into, this light has my wholehearted and enthusiastic recommendation. It's a bit expensive with a starting price of $78, but I think this is well justified and actually is an excellent value for what you're getting. Note that the price of the light will increase depending on the emitters chosen and any specialty customizations. The 219B light goes for about $95, while the W2 version is $120. Both of these lights were sent to me by Jackson Lee, who sells Hank's lights at jlhawaii808.com. He's the exclusive retailer of MSR and Noctagon lights, and alongside the standard configurations, he has many interesting varieties in stock and available for purchase. The price will be a few dollars higher than MSRP, but Jackson offers extremely fast shipping and is great with communication, so I highly recommend purchasing from his store. You can of course buy these directly from Hank at internationaloutdoor.com, where the lights can be configured as desired. Shipping times will be much longer, but Hank is great to work with. However, if you want a custom order or a more unique emitter, I would recommend looking at Jackson's store first to see if there are any in stock, or if anyone might happen to be selling a used light. Hank is very busy and doesn't have tons of extra time to fill special requests. In addition, the W2 version of this light is only carried at Jackson's store and is not available on Hank's site. Finally, I highly recommend picking up the flashing kit along with the light. This will allow you to update the firmware as desired and opens up a whole new world of interesting possibilities. It can be complicated to use, but is a worthwhile piece of equipment to own. Alrighty, I hope you enjoyed this review. It was a really fun one to make. I have become a very big fan of Hank's lights. They consistently manage to exceed my expectations. The DT8 is not a light for everyone, definitely not, and it's a very niche product. I understand why this light would not be appealing to a lot of people, and even I thought it was kind of dumb when I first saw it. Uh, however, this is really my honest opinion. I, I just love this light. I want to give a big thanks to Jackson Lee for sending these for review. I really appreciate the opportunity. As these were sent to me at no cost, you can assume I'm biased if you want, but uh, all test results and opinions here are my own. If you do buy this light or any other from Jackson's store after watching this video, let him know you came from this video. It really helps the channel out. Uh, there's going to be more awesome videos coming, so stay tuned for future uploads. If you have any questions or suggestions for me, please leave them down in the comments below. And if you found this video helpful, consider sharing it with others who might enjoy it. Uh, I guess if you hated it, you can put mean things down below too. That would be appreciated. And with that, I will see you in the next video.